How's everybody doing? Yeah? Good. Well, I'm really excited to be here and talking with you guys. Um, I wasn't here last week. Duncan is super echoey. Is that normal up here? OK. Um, yeah, I was taking care of all of our kids last week. Um, so I got to watch Lori's message on YouTube. And it was amazing. I really enjoyed it. Um, this series has been really, really fun so far. Do you guys agree? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, Peter is going to preach next week, and I'm really excited about it. So, no pressure. OK, so tonight we're going to be talking about uh, Jonah. And um, I had a lot of fun researching for this uh, message, and I feel like I say that every week, but um, it's just true. All I knew about Jonah was what I learned from VeggieTales growing up. Have you guys watched VeggieTales? Um, <clears throat> so I was like Googling something for the cover, and <laughs> I found this photo, and I thought it was so, so funny. Because um, it's like, Jonah, where's your clothes? Like. Did you get naked before they threw you off the boat, or did they like disintegrate? It was just kind of a funny photo. So I hope you guys appreciate that. Um, it's the first time you've seen a butt in a sermon, probably. <laughs> oh, man. OK. Um, so I want to give some credit to um, this really cool Bible scholar called Tim Mackey. He's also one of the co-founders of the Bible Project, if you guys have ever heard of that. Um, Sorry, it's really hot. Um, I watched a five-part series on Jonah from Tim Mackey on YouTube, um, and it's an incredible sermon series. And a lot of the information I got, I actually got from this guy. So um, I can't relay all of it to you, obviously, because it was a five-part series. But if you are Bible nerds and you like to go learn stuff, go YouTube that, and it's really cool. Um, anyway, Book of Jonah is basically this prophet of God who's supposed to be super righteous. Um, God says, hey, Jonah, go talk to these people. And then he disobeys, and he gets swallowed by a fish, and then he gets spit back out. Then he goes and does what he was originally supposed to do, and then he gets mad at God, and the book ends. And you're like, why is this here? <laughs> like, how is this relevant? And I feel like a lot of times that happens with the Old Testament. We read that or some story in the Old Testament, we're like, why is this here? Why is this important? Um, but the book of Jonah is actually amazing. Um, so if you guys are all just kind of like really apprehensive right now about how this sermon is going to apply to your life, just stick with me, and uh, we'll just go through it together. So if you guys don't know, this book is four chapters long, and they're actually really short chapters. So we're just going to read all of the chapters together. I hope that's okay. Um, and we're going to look at four different points where Jonah either has a choice to choose godliness or choose a path of compromise. And um, there's four different points where he chooses one or the other. So we're going to do that. We're going to start with chapter one. And I have it up here for you guys. Okay, so it starts, Jonah runs from the Lord. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. <laughs> he went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. It's okay to laugh at certain points when I'm reading this. I think this book is really humorous. <clears throat> but the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. 
Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this? He shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. Then the crew cast lots, which is like, I guess, rolling dice, I guess, um, to see which of them had offended the gods and caused the terrible storm. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. Why has this awful storm come down on us, they demanded. Who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What is your nationality? Jonah answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. The sailors were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them he was running away from the Lord. Oh, why did you do it? They groaned. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, what should we do to you to stop the storm? Throw me into the sea, Jonah said, and it will become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. Instead, the sailors rowed even harder to get the ship to land, but the stormy sea was too violent for them, and they couldn't make it. Then they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God. Oh, Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin, and don't hold us responsible for his death. Oh, Lord, you have sent this storm upon him for your own good reasons. Then the sailors picked Jonah up and threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Where apparently he loses all of his clothing. Okay. So chapter one, we see here, God tells Jonah, his prophet, like this is his job. God gives Jonah a message. Jonah travels, delivers the message. That's like what he does. Um, He tells Jonah, I see this this city, Nineveh, um, which is not like a Jewish city. It's just some random city, some pagan city. I see how wicked this city is, and it's time for judgment. And... What he actually tells Jonah is really interesting. He says, I want you to cry out against it. The wording in Jonah is a little bit different than most other prophet books of the Bible. Um, Usually there's like this long, God says, you know, give this message, and it's like long chapters of just all the things that people are doing wrong and all the things that God is going to do in judgment. Um, But it's really brief, and God says, just cry out against the city, basically saying how wrong they are. And this makes Jonah want to run. So I want to give you guys some background about Nineveh first, um, because I just didn't know much about it either. Um, I think on the next slide, there's a... So hopefully you guys can see this okay. So um, there's actually a lot of ruins in Nineveh, which is, I think, in modern-day Iraq, that you can see or in museums. But... In all their palaces, they would, like, carve these giant pieces of stone to, like, tell stories. And this is one of those pieces of artwork. And what you actually can see is, like, a really good snapshot of the cruelty of the city of Nineveh. So they were a part of the Assyrians. And they were such a skilled war machine that modern-day governments actually, or, like, military, still study their war tactics today because they were, like, just amazing at war and conquering things, I guess. Um, Anyway, it was typical of these Assyrian warriors to capture people and then hold them down and skin them alive. (laughs) So, um, which is not funny. I'm not not chuckling about that. But um, anyway, Nineveh is this gigantic city about 500 miles away from where Jonah is currently um, in Israel. And so um, they have about... 100,000 people in their city, which back then is just amazing. It's unheard of um, to be able to support that population of people. And um, they're very close to Israel. And so if you're Jonah, um, Israel has not been conquered by the Assyrians yet, but it's going to be. So you have this like 
little tiny country and like looming in the corner is like this giant, you know, mega war machine. And then God tells you to go tell these people that they're sinning. And Jonah's like, "Mm, I don't think so. (laughs) So he gets up and he leaves. And he goes the opposite direction to Tarshish. And so I have a map that shows you. Um, So uh, Jonah is in Joppa. Nineveh is like 500 miles away. He gets on a boat to go to Tarshish. And in in Jonah's day, this is like the farthest you can go. Um, This is like the edge of the known world for Jonah. Um, And so he's really, really trying to get as far away from God as he can. Um, But it gets really ridiculous in this story because he's like trying to run away from God. And how many of you know you can't actually run away from God? (laughs) Like if he created the whole world, obviously he can see you. So Jonah's on this ship. God sends this amazing storm. And there's all of these pagan sailors on the top deck. They're like trying to get a grip. They're tossing things overboard. They're trying to figure out like which one of you did something wrong and which of the gods is punishing us right now. Um, These people don't believe in like Yahweh God. They're just pagan sailors. And um, they're all panicking. And then they're like, wait a minute. Where's that one guy that we let onto our ship? So they go down, the captain goes down and finds Jonah sleeping. And he's like, what are you doing? Like, this is ridiculous. How are you sleeping right now? Pray to your God. So um, just like a side quest right now. I think it's hilarious that Jonah is asleep because even these pagan sailors know that this is like a divine intervention with this storm. And Jonah is just completely oblivious to it. Um, but I think it's really analogous to how some Christians live their life when they choose to disobey God. Um, you kind of like put yourself into this sleep. There's like all of this stuff going on around you and you're just kind of dead to it all. Um, I was reading a commentary and this, this Bible scholar, David Guzik points out that you can be asleep and still walk, still talk. You can still cry and laugh and think. Um, you can look right, but you're actually not right because you're asleep. And I think that's really true of some Christians. Um, Spurgeon has this really cool quote. Um, if you're a Christian and you're like, well, how do you know if you're awake then? Um, he says, then what do you mean by a man's being really awake? I mean two or three things. I mean, first, his having a thorough consciousness of the reality of spiritual things. When I speak of a wakeful man, I mean one who does not take the soul to be a fancy, nor heaven to be a fiction, nor hell to be a tale, but who acts among the sons of men as though these were the only substances and all other things the shadows. I want men of stern resolution, for no Christian is awake unless he steadfastly determines to serve his God, come fair, come foul." So we can see here that Jonah is not awake, even when he's actually awake. And because of this, he's not actually ready to serve God. He's not awake to the reality of heaven and hell. He looks great on the outside, but he's not legit. So all the sailors are casting lots and trying to figure out some kind of answer to help them survive this storm And when they cast the dice, they figure out somehow that Jonah is the one that's at fault for this storm. And so they question him, and he kind of like almost confesses. He's like, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord Yahweh, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. And it's so ironic in this book, because Jonah says, I'm a Hebrew, I worship Yahweh, he created the heavens and the seas, and It seems like a good approach to the situation maybe to just confess, but maybe witness at the same time to these guys. But Jonah is actually just like paying lip service to God without actually having it line up with his actions. Like if you actually believed that God created the heaven and the earth, then why did you think you could run from him in the first place? So these pagans, I'm sure, are just like, what is your problem? Like, you, you don't actually believe these things. Because if you thought that, you wouldn't be here right now. 
And they fear God more than he does because they're like, we're not going to throw you overboard. Like, there's real penalties for killing people. <laughs> um, and so they try to do the best they can before they throw him overboard. But finally, they're just like, we can't, we can't survive this without doing it. So the first compromise we see in the first chapter is that Jonah does not fear God. This is his first choice to compromise. It's not necessarily that he ran away from God, which I think a lot of Bible stories kind of highlight. It's that he doesn't fear and revere God and respect him for who he is. Throughout the book, we see this parallel between Jonah and, and different pagans that he inter, like, interacts with. And we see that Jonah is supposed to be this righteous man of God, but all he does is pay lip service to him. He doesn't actually love or fear God. So later, so these pagans throw Jonah over the boat, and then later they go, and with fear and trembling, they make sacrifices to Yahweh and vow to serve Yahweh. So Jonah inadvertently like converts these sailors, which is amazing, because they see the power of God to start and stop this storm. Okay, so chapter 2. God prepares a fish to swallow Jonah, and he is there for three days and three nights. So Jonah's in the belly of this fish, and he offers up this really beautiful prayer to the Lord. He says, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, O oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more toward your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves, and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth, whose gates lock shut forever. But you, O oh Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death, as my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies, but I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. Okay. Okay. So Jonah is like in the belly of this fish for three days, and he's reflecting on his situation, and he looks towards God's holy temple and remembers that the Lord is his only hope of salvation, and Jonah makes a promise to keep his original promise. So in chapter 2, Jonah gets it right. He knows that his God desires mercy, that his love is everlasting, and his patience is enduring. And he knows that even if we get it totally wrong and we rebel and we reject God, God's desire is that we would return to him with repentant hearts. And this prayer really reflects that, and it's really good. Um, in verses 1 and 2, it says, Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. It's like Jonah gets saved all over again. Jonah shows us that no matter what, it is godly to turn back to God and know in full confidence, you can know in full confidence that he will hear you even from the land of death that you have navigated yourself into. Jonah says, you threw me into the ocean depths and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, O oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more toward your holy temple. Um, when we choose to compromise, like Jonah did, we are actually choosing to separate ourselves from the presence of the Lord. And that degree of separation can look different depending on the choice, but we're just choosing to separate ourselves from from the presence of the Lord. If you feel like God is far away, maybe just question and ask yourself, have I done anything lately to make those steps away from the Lord? It might not be him. It might actually be you. 
This is what actually disturbs Jonah the most, not necessarily that he's sitting in the belly of a fish, but that the presence of the Lord isn't with him. He feels alone. And instead of ignoring God, he prays and he asks God, I want to look once more toward your holy temple. And this is so true for us today. It's not about getting into heaven or escaping hell. It's about being with the Lord. The psalmist David says, "Better is it David? Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. <clears throat> Jonah says in verse 8, Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies, but I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows. Disobedience is the result of idolatry. You have to remember you can only serve one master, Jesus or yourself. If you choose to worship another, you are turning your back on all of God's mercies. So we have to choose wisely. In verse 9, But I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Jonah does this really godly thing in recognizing that only Yahweh can provide his salvation, literally from the fish, but also for his soul. What he fails to recognize in this prayer is that salvation is something that God wants to extend to every tribe and nation. And that's not really all his fault, right? Jesus hadn't come yet, so he didn't really know that. But even the despised Assyrians in Nineveh who skin people alive, God cares and loves. But nevertheless, God commands the fish to spit Jonah out, and Jonah makes good on his vows. For some reason, God is determined to use this man, Jonah, to accomplish his purposes in Nineveh. So chapter 2, after Jonah compromises, He chooses godliness, and he repents. Um, And I want to just say, um, your need for repentance does not diminish your message or your testimony, uh, your witness to other people. It actually strengthens it. Okay, We're all human. We all do things that we shouldn't do. Okay. So chapter 3, Jonah gets spit out onto the beach, And then he goes to Nineveh. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. It's like eight words. The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one... Not even the animals from your herds and flocks may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. So we see that Jonah makes good on his promise. He goes all the way back to Nineveh. And what I find so interesting in this chapter is that Jonah preaches the most minimal sermon I have ever read in the Bible. (laughs) In 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. And I think this is really cool. I don't know if this is a literal thing, like if Jonah actually just preached those words or if it's like condensed for some reason. But either way, it seems like it's giving the impression that Jonah is like, okay, I'm going to keep my promise, but I'm going to do the bare minimum. I'm going to like just barely eke out a word 
and hope that that's enough. And if I were in Nineveh, I'd be like, well, why are we being destroyed? What did we do wrong? Who are we supposed to repent to? Um, why are our cows involved? Like, it's just very confusing. Um, but it's amazing because they get it somehow, and they repent, and they turn back to God. And even more incredible, the king hears the message, and he literally steps off of his throne He takes off his royal robes, and he starts mourning for his sins. He acknowledges that Yahweh is the true God, and then he commands everyone else to do the same thing. And when God sees this, he relents, and he changes his mind, and he holds back their judgment. Um, As I was reflecting on this passage, I was, um, the Holy Spirit reminded me of this quote by E.M. Bounds. um, Men are God's method. The church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. Um, We don't know why, I mean, we do know why. God, God chooses not to just appear somehow in the city of Nineveh and say, you know, you're, you're, wicked and cruel, and now I'm going to smite you. (laughs) Um, He chooses the most disobedient prophet and is trying to work out this story of salvation through Jonah. And so um, he's on a greater mission through Jonah. As we can see in verse 5, it says, The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. Um, The the word believed in this um, verse is a Hebrew word. uh, It's pronounced amen. Can you guys say amen? Um, I pressed the little microphone button on Blue Letter Bible, and it literally was like, oh, man, and I thought that was funny. (laughs) Anyways, it's a Hebrew word, and um, I thought it was really cool because it doesn't use the word repentance. It uses the word they believed. Um, The people of Nineveh believed what Jonah said. This word, ah, man, um, I looked up what it means, and it means to support something to confirm, to be faithful, and to nourish. And then it used this phrase that I thought was really interesting, probably probably because I'm a mom, I'll just admit it. It means to hold in your arms as you would a child. So it's almost like the Ninevites, these cruel, like I'm imagining like hairy troll orc people who like to skin people. And then this guy is like, hey, repent, you know, turn back to Yahweh. And they just like pick up this message this tiny little baby message, and they cradle it in their arms, and they change. And it's like this beautiful thing. And they turn around toward Yahweh, and they change. And I just think that's amazing that God would take back people like this, people like Jonah, all because they just were sorry. I think it's beautiful. This shows us that repentance appeals to God's mercy, not his judgment. And so in chapter 3, we can see that, again, Jonah chooses godliness by obeying and fulfilling his vow. Even though he does the bare minimum. Okay, chapter 4. Are you guys still with me? Is this kind of making sense? Okay. That's good. Okay, so Jonah chapter 4. So he preaches this message, everybody's fasting, even the cows, and this change of plans greatly upset Jonah because God changed his mind and forgave them. And he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. (laughs) 
I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Okay, Jonah, who apparently is four. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? So very patiently, is it right for you to be angry about this? Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there, and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged for a worm. Um, the little cute Arabic worm in Veggie Tales. Um, the next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and it died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness. Uh, some translations say they don't know their left hand from their right hand. Not to mention all the animals. Animals are like a really significant thing in this city. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? End. The story ends. <laughs> it's like, okay. Why does it end there? So we see in chapter 4, when God saw what they had done and that they had put a stop to all of their evil ways, he changed his mind, and he did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. So why is Jonah so displeased and so angry when God decides not to demolish the Ninevites? We have a couple more Hebrew words. Um, it's not just that he's like, oh, man, shucks. You know, I, I really wanted to see a campfire today. Um, these Hebrew words are, um, I'm not going to try to pronounce them in um, mess it up, but these two words. So the first one, ra'ah ah, maybe, um, means that Jonah is literally being evil and wicked, and he's wishing to harm or injure somebody. It also can be translated, he is broken into pieces because he is so angry. Have you guys ever felt like so angry that you just felt like you were going to combust? You were going to bust out of your skin? Uh, the second one means to burn with anger. Uh, and when you burn with this kind of anger, you can see it in somebody's eyes, how angry they are. So Jonah's not just like mildly disappointed, like he wants to harm these people. He is being evil and wicked. And what we see embodied in Jonah in this moment is arrogance. Um, it's a special kind of evil to wish harm upon somebody, even your enemies. And once again, Jonah has missed the heart of God. Every now and then, our hearts, if you picture them like buckets, they get kicked over and something is going to spill out. I think it's Winky Prattney that uses this analogy. So every now and then, the buckets of our hearts get kicked over and something spills out. It's either water or it's acid. And in this moment, we see that Jonah has acid in his hearts. He wishes that God would demolish these people. There's a poem by um, Jonathan Swift, who has a really funny hairdo. Um, I was working on these slides, and Elodie saw this slide, and she points to this guy and goes, baby. <laughs> it was funny. It was really cute. Anyway, he wrote this poem about, um, about Jonah. It says, we are God's chosen few. All others will be damned. There is no place in heaven for you. We can't have heaven crammed. Are you guys like, like, do you, can you sit with that? Like how evil and wicked that is? You know, like, do you feel that in your heart? How awful? 
So Jonah goes to move outside the city because he's hoping and praying that God will change his mind again and burn these people alive, and he doesn't, he doesn't want to get burned, so he moves outside the city. And he starts railing at God. See, I knew you would do this. This is why I ran away. It's not because I was afraid. It's because I knew your character, and I didn't want you to forgive these people. You are merciful. You're compassionate. You're patient. You're slow to anger. You're unfailing in your love, and you are eager to turn back from destroying people. And if this is the kind of God you are, then just kill me now. <laughs> Two chapters ago, this is the same guy who's praying this beautiful prayer about, God, I just don't want to be separated from you. Take me back. And he's missing it again. It's just incredible to me. How could he have already forgotten what he prayed in the belly of the fish, and is now wishing for death. Jonah would rather die apart from God because how dare God not adhere to his agenda? Jonah wants nothing to do with an eternity that also includes his enemies. But here's the thing. The very character trait that Jonah so despises about God is also the same thing that's preserving his life. How many of you know like God could have just taken Jonah's breath away before he even finished that sentence? And yet God, slow to anger, just lets Jonah rail against him in all of his arrogance. God does not smite Jonah where he stands. Instead, he provides a plant to shade Jonah. And for the first time in all of the book, we see Jonah happy. He is comfortable as he waits in eager anticipation for the demise of these people in Nineveh. Jonah is an entitled, spoiled, Pharisee, toddler baby man. God owes him everything, and everyone else is despicable and deserves to die. As he sits there under the plant. So in verses 7 through 10, it says, But God also arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah reported, retorted, even angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about this plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly, it died quickly, and Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left, not to mention all the cows. Shouldn't I feel entitled and sorry for this city? And then the story ends. There's no response. God is basically telling Jonah, you've developed such a deep affection for this plant that hasn't even lived like 12 hours. You had no influence or hand in making it spring up or making it die. And you feel so deeply for this plant. But don't I have a right to feel so deeply about all of these people who I created, who I sustain from day to day? And you're sitting there saying you just want to die because your plant is gone? And Jonah just sits there with no reply. The book ends, and we're all just like, what happened? <laughs> why do you think God wanted Jonah to cry out against the city? Jonah knew why. Wasn't it so they could turn back to God for life? We see that God used Jonah, and through refining Jonah, he arranged for a great fish, he arranged for a plant, he arranged for a worm, he arranged a scorching wind, he arranged for a storm. And God, through all of these circumstances, is trying to refine Jonah, his chosen prophet. And the story just ends with Jonah wishing for death. And God answers him in patience and love. When the story started with Jonah crying out against a city, 
the book ends with God crying out against his own prophet in the hopes, I think, that Jonah will turn back to God for life. In chapter 4, we see that Jonah compromises because he feels entitled. He chooses to feel entitled even though the reality of the truth of God is right in front of him, that God cares about everyone. Jonah chooses to believe it's all about him. We don't know Jonah's final words, but I think that's actually for a reason. I think this story is actually a parable. It's not really actually about Jonah. It's about you and me as we're reading this book. I think what we're supposed to do with the book of Jonah is not just read it and be like, that would make a great movie (laughs) to entertain some kids. I think it's actually supposed to be kind of like a mirror that we hold up and we look at ourselves and we ask ourselves, how are we going to respond when God attempts to refine you and I? Walking with Jesus is to partner with God on his mission to reconcile the lost to himself because he is worthy. It's to the glory of his name that every knee should bow and acknowledge that he is the one true God. When God sends us on assignment, will you fear him enough to obey? When God puts you before the unbelieving, will you honor him with your lips as well as your life actions? When you mess up, because we all will, will you repent in faith that he is faithful to forgive? When the opportunity arises, will you go anywhere for Jesus, even to your enemy, knowing that God will forgive them? Will you fulfill your promise to God to make him Lord of your life and your steps, even when it doesn't align with your agenda? Will you end your attitude of entitlement and forsake the belief that God owes you something so that you can have compassion on those who are destined for destruction? Jonah got some things right. And he got a lot of other things wrong. And I think that's actually us to a T. We get some things right and we get a lot of things wrong. But if we can reflect on his story, we can perceive the heart of God and respond accordingly. Our story doesn't have to end the same way that Jonah's did. Even when Jonah sentenced himself to die, apart from the inconvenient reality of God's character, God does not forsake Jonah, and he won't forsake you and me. The question is, are we going to forsake him? We must be faithful to the process of his refining because it is to our benefit. In Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, if you guys want to pray this with me, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. So, Lord, we thank you for this weird and unique story in your word. God, we thank you that nothing um, is by mistake and that everything is ordained and planned by you. And, Jesus, I just ask for um, conviction, God, that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts God, that we would um, hold your word up to our hearts like a mirror and that we would allow you to change us. God, help us to be humble and obedient to you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this gathering. Um, God, help us to honor you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.